I want to thank you all for, for choosing to start your day with us here. Um, uh, my name is Peter Mandeville. I'm a professor of international affairs at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. I'm also a non-resident senior fellow uh, here at Brookings with the Center for Middle East Policy. Um, and on behalf of the Center for Middle East Policy here at Brookings, and also our partner this morning, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University, uh, I'd like to formally welcome you here today. Uh, the topic today is one that uh, I know is on the minds of many of you. Uh, it's a topic and an issue around which there have been many developments uh, in, in recent years. We're going to be talking about the future of political Islam. Um, the, the, the broad backdrop for this, for this discussion, um, I think, dates back to a series of very dramatic shifts uh, in the terrain of Islam and politics, primarily in the Middle East, that we've seen since the Arab uprisings uh, of some seven years ago now. And you know, one of the main story there is, of course, the seeming precipitous rise uh, of the political prominence of Islamist parties and movements in the Middle East, those groups seemingly being the primary benefactors uh, of those dramatic political changes in the region. But then very quickly, the seemingly also quick uh, uh, fall uh, of these groups, um, I think perhaps most dramatically illustrated by the case of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt. So I think one of the standard, na standard narratives or storylines that we're going to be looking at this morning is this idea that Islamist parties uh, ascended very quickly in political prominence after the Arab Spring and then and very quickly um, uh, diminished in terms of their, of their in influence. Um, Second is uh, the fact that the question of support for Islamist parties uh, like the Muslim Brotherhood and others of that ilk has itself, of course, become uh, a major point of contention in the geopolitics of the Middle East today, where we have a number of uh, countries um, such as Turkey and Qatar seemingly more supportive of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and then a set of, of other nations, uh, namely the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, uh, forming something of an anti-MB axis. So rather than just the question of whether these groups are rising and falling in influence, um, we have this kind of broader geopolitical context around them. And then finally, um, uh, the kind of social fact uh, that I think challenges this standard uh, story that these groups um, you know, rose very quickly and then fell very quickly is the fact that according to public opinion polling, in many countries around the Arab world, Islamist parties still continue to enjoy relatively significant levels of support in society. Indeed, uh, in a number of countries such as Morocco, the largest party in the governing coalition uh, is of Islamist orientation. Um, in Jordan, the largest opposition bloc in that country's parliament is Islamist, um, and these groups continue to be prominent political players in other, other countries around the region. So there's no simple narrative uh, in, in which Islamism uh, can be figured as a spent uh, political force. So this is the kind of broad, broad, broad backdrop against which our discussion will be occurring this morning. Uh, and I'm thrilled that I'm, I'm joined up here on the stage uh, by two absolutely superb scholars who have themselves devoted their professional lives to the study uh, of political Islam uh, to engage me in conversation. I'll introduce them both briefly. Um, you have full bios of each of them in the information packets that you, you picked up up front. Uh, immediately to my left, uh, Jocelyn Cesari is a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown and also professor of uh, religion and politics at Birmingham University in the UK. Uh, in addition, she teaches at, at Harvard University, where she directs an interfaculty program there uh, on Islam and the West. Uh, to Jocelyn's left is Shadi Hamid, who's a senior fellow here at the Brookings Center for Middle East Policy, where he helps to anchor the project on U.S. relations with the Islamic world. And previously, Shadi was the director of research uh, out at the, <coughs> excuse me, the Brookings Doha uh, Center. So. 
very briefly um, the format uh, th this morning. I'm going <clears> to <throat> pose a broad opening question to each of, of um, uh, our, our, our panelists uh, to give them a sense or give them an opportunity to give us a, a kind of a slightly more extended overview of how they see the question of political Islam to today. Um, and this then will be followed by a conversation between the uh, three of us. Um, we have a very high quotient of political Islam nerddom concentrated up here. Uh, and so if allowed to go unfettered, this would go all morning long into the afternoon and deep into the night. So in order to make sure that that doesn't happen, uh, when we reach about the 10.30 mark, we're going to pivot and turn to you in order to bring your questions and comments into the discussion. So, so that's, that's essentially our format this morning. Um, so Jocelyn, let, let me start with you, if, if I may. Um, you know, the, the standard analytical line on political Islam uh, in the scholarly literature as well as in the sort of policy discussion has tended to take very specific groups and movements and just kind of analyze their evolution <clears throat> and their reaction to various events in, in world regions, or the discussion has been kind of shaped and organized by debates around questions like whether Islamism and democracy are compatible, whether Islam is compatible with the modern nation state, uh, is Islam compatible with modernity. But you have a new book that's just come out uh, called What is Political Islam, I'm that, gonna do my promotion. <laughs> that 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 takes that approaches this question from a rather different vantage point. So I'm wondering if I could invite you to tell us a little bit about um, the way in which you approach this question in the book. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. Um, the book is out, actually the outcome of a research that I started almost ten years ago, looking at the status of state and Islam relationship in Egypt, in Turkey, Pakistan, Iraq, um, and Tunisia. And I started the book just before the, the so-called Arab Spring. And this book came out, it's called The Awakening of Muslim Democracy, and I realized that there were lots of misunderstanding about Mm, the position that came from this book was, oh, you are not focusing anymore on the political party, you are focusing on the action of the state vis-a-vis -vis the political party. And so I, I felt the need to expand a little more. It's not about state policies vis-a-vis -vis Islam, it's a broader uh, ground than that. And the last motivation came from the ISIS discussion. I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago, there was a, a discussion triggered by uh, an article in the Atlantic Monthly where a professor of Islamic studies said that ISIS was Islamic. And so it triggered a lot of reaction with two, two sides. The political scientists, more or less, saying, no, this has nothing to do with Islam. And the specialist of Islam, which I think it's the first time they came so strongly in the public space, saying, you know, there are elements in it that touch on Islamic religion. And, and then it was a dead end because there was no real common ground. And so you cannot disqualify the Islamic dimension of claims from ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but you cannot at the same time say that this represents the Islamic tradition. So what does it mean clearly? So my goal in this new book is to tease out from um, the previous research and expanding on it, showing that Political Islam is a new form of governmentality. And when I use the term, it is not about state policy. It is about a political culture. And the distinction that is helpful here is ideology and culture. And what happened at the end of the Ottoman Empire and the rise of nation state that was actually built by secular leaders, Gamal Abdel Nasser, Bourguiba, uh, Kamala Taturk, I s actually all of them, even when they declared themselves secular, did something that is nationalizing Islam. But again, it goes beyond the state uh, accaparating or, or controlling all Islamic institutions. It was an attempt to 
include Islam in the building of a new nation. And this is important to understand because we take the nation state as a as granted unit, nation state. What happened in the Muslim world is that the state came before the nation. And so in the engineering of the nation, the Islamic dimension was key. So what the secular leaders did everywhere was to create a connection that didn't exist before between Islamic belonging and national belonging. It's not about the beliefs. It is not about you know, the, the piety of people. It is about the sense that I am a Muslim and I am a legitimate member of this political community. Otherwise, how do you explain that in secular country like Turkey, Alevi have problems? And not because of Islamists, but because of the vision that the, being a Turkish Muslim is the cornerstone of the national identity. It happened everywhere. The only countries that do not create what I call this particular form of governmentality, which is hegemonic Islam. It means that there is a sense shared by all, secular and Islamist, that it is right to be a citizen and belong and be a Muslim. It doesn't mean you have to pray five times a day. Actually, most people don't. It doesn't mean you have to respect all the prescription. It is about the sense of what is the right community. And this is process of modernization. And again, this goes against all the received ideas that there is no modernization, no reform. Most of the Muslim claims in politics come from reform movement, not from the tradition itself. So um, these two entities together will create indeed this cultural ground on which then it's, it's indeed uh, a second wave where you, you see rising political parties with an Islamic agenda because none of them really challenge the Islamic belonging and the national belonging. What do they ask for? An Islamic state. Why do they ask for an Islamic state? Because deep down it's agreed on that Islamic belonging, nation state belonging goes together. But they will now ask for something that the secular initially didn't envision, which is it is not Islamic enough. And it goes with attempting to introduce um, more prescriptions that, that make Islam a regulator of public space. And then the, the fight is on the behaving. Even if you look at the ISIS attempt, it was a strong attempt to codify and regulate the behavior of people in the public space. We, which, again, if we think that this is the Islamic tradition, we are mistaken, but we cannot take at face value what the actors are saying. So that's why I reintroduce this long story. So if I have to finish there on a nutshell, if we want to understand the role of Islam in politics, we have to take it in, the, in these two aspects. It's part of a political culture, so we have to look at what do people have learned or have been socialized in, in terms of what is to be a Muslim, what is to be a citizen, and you'd be very surprised how much of it is ingrained by the secular education. And, this, and most of majority Muslim countries have done this job. The exception are Senegal, Indonesia, and um, Lebanon, which is a sort of sectarian democracy. Otherwise, the diversity of religion, including the diversity into Islam, has not been acknowledged anywhere. And interestingly, some of these countries are democracy. So I want to show you just a couple of slides because we take the debate, and, and I understand why it's so tempting to say, you know, this is Islam. Uh, I'm going to push the other one. So you see, these are the, the statistics on political violence. And everybody acknowledged that Muslim majority country are coming on top. So it's very easy. That's why a lot of people think, still think that the clash of civilization is a good 
explanation for this phenomenon. What I have done that I could not show you here is to operationalize this vision of an hegemon, this conception of hegemonic Islam and to apply it to database. And what you see emerging is that the state religion relationship is key to explain the tendency to political violence and also social hostility in, uh, in society. It is not Islam as such. It is a sort of cult culture that can indeed be declined into different ideological positions that is at the core of political Islam. And interestingly, if you look at Buddhism in Sri Lanka, it's exactly the same thing. That's why people are, don't understand why is Buddhism, Buddhism a religion of peace and love? You know, why do we have warriors, monk warriors? If you listen to their, to their discourse, they're saying exactly that. You can only be a Buddhist if you want to be a national. So what does it mean concretely? My, I'm not a policymaker, so, and I can appreciate the, the challenge to, to channel this kind of approach into policymaking. But I think we are at a stage where we realize that politics, 90% of it is communication, right? We have examples every day of that. So if we get this, what does it mean? I think from the Western point of view, we have a few things that we cannot keep saying. First, that Islam needs reform. The political Islam I'm talking about is the outcome of reform. What we need is a more learned and informed population, including non-Muslim, of what is Islam. And it, it goes for the policy makers themselves. And we should not be, I put myself in it because I'm a political scientist to start with, we should not be intimidated by looking at what religion means in different contexts. Because it's key to understand how people behave. So let's, let's finish with Islam need reform. First, Muslims in two thirds of, the, uh, of, of countries do not understand what this means because they have been agitating the question of Islam and modernity and, and reform since 1798 when Bonaparte went to Egypt with not only military but also scholars. This is a starting point. So when we come out and say, oh, we need to reform Islam, this is a debate that has been going on for two centuries. One. And second, um, we uh, should also be aware that Muslim democracy can be possible. It doesn't mean that we have to apologize or to be apologetic on all dimensions, but we have to be very clear on when and how religion plays a role in a democratization process. And there are four elements we can, we can evaluate. First is free and fair election. Are Islamic parties against it or for it? As, you, as Peter just mentioned, most of them now have accepted that free and fair election is something to work with. Then we have separation of the powers. Do they work with that or not? The third dimension is the rule of law. Do, do people accept the rule of law? And the fourth dimension is all questions of human rights, civil rights, and in, from my own review, most of the Islamic parties today are fighting on this element, which, which concerns the body of women, most of it, and the freedom of speech. But if you look, so what does it mean if you want free and fair election, if you accept separation of power, but you are still fighting on right of sexual minority or women's body? This is the fight of a lot of democracy, including ours today. So we should not put everything in one package. And, and that's the problem I'm having with Islam needs reforms, Islam needs modernization, and Islam is incompatible with democracy. It depends where. Where do you put your, your spotlight? And, and that's... That's my only, I would say, uh, token <laughs> a part of this presentation vis-a-vis -vis policymaker, because this is not easy to do. You need political courage, but it's more a practical approach to, to what I try to do in this book. Thank you. Great. Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jocelyn. I think your approach very usefully kind of turns on its head 
the conventional wisdom that defines the analytical and, and even scholarly frame around this issue. So Shadi, I wanted to turn to you now. Um, you've, you know, you've produced over the last few years a, a series of books that, that have, um, you know, one in Islamic exceptionalism looked at the very unique nature of the relationship between Islam and, and politics kind of historically and, and the connection of that to kind of present developments. You've done a book on Islamist parties specifically that also kind of challenges some of the di di discussion around participation and moderation that's kind of defined the academic literature. But you, you know, you and Will McCants also did an edited book recently that does kind of look very much at how specific groups and movements in particular countries have responded to the developments of, you know, the the Arab Spring and and afterwards. So. I just wanted to start by kind of asking you how you kind of currently think about um, the kind of landscape around political Islam in the Middle East. Yeah, uh, thank you, Peter. So, so I'll start with a, an anecdote that has sort of stuck with me. And so I was talking to um, a mid-level Muslim Brotherhood official in 2010. And I tell this story a lot because I think it, it, it's really important and it conveys something that I think we in the West don't always fully grasp. We were talking about why people join the Brotherhood. And a lot of people have their own conversion story of how they came to be a part of this movement. Um, from a scholarly perspective, we, we often focus on sort of structural factors like um, you know, economic as, uh, issues, rural urban migration, being pissed off at America, things like that. Um, and, um, and all those things matter, of course, but, he, he, but then he told me, well, Shadi, for some people it's simpler than that. And um, some people join the Muslim Brotherhood because they want to get into heaven. And I thought this was a nice way of putting it. Um, and uh, so basically the idea there is that if you want to be a better Muslim, it's good to be part of a movement or an organization that pressures you or pushes you to be more strict in your observance and sort of encourage the bonds of community among, so to speak, your brothers. And um, so if you're a better Muslim, what happens then? You have a better chance of getting into heaven. And that's not to say that people, so if you're joining a protest as a Muslim Brotherhood member or if you're voting for a member of parliament, those are obviously political things and you must, you presumably will have views about that candidate or about that protest and what that protest is calling for. But underlying that is a deeper motivation that in the end you are serving God. You are not just doing this for the sake of it. And there is an idea that you will get more good deeds and that this will help you in the day of judgment. And, you know, I mentioned this and I emphasize this because I think that, you know, when I was in graduate school, I presume also when, when you guys were in graduate school, we didn't really talk a lot about paradise or the day of judgment and what that could mean for individual members of Islamist movements. And we might say, I think, and a lot of people would say here in the U.S. or in Europe, well, that's an irrational impulse. You know, over the years, I've really come to the conclusion that that's actually the most rational impulse of all. If your starting assumption is that there is something called heaven and that heaven is eternal, what could be more rational than trying to plan ahead for what will ultimately be your eternity? That seems like a very logical step to take. Anyway, so... This sort of gets at, I think, the very complex interaction between what we call religion and what we call politics. And I've sort of gotten, I've moved, be, I think a lot of us have moved beyond this idea of saying that, okay, they are being driven by religion versus they are being driven by politics or power, as if these two things are separate. And in the years that I've been spending um, interviewing and hanging out with Islamists in various parts of the world, um, if, and if I asked them, why do you do what you do? They would never say, is it because of, and I would ask, the follow-up would be, is it because of religion or is it because of politics? They wouldn't understand the question. That question doesn't make sense to them. And why would it? It's a sort of, you know, um, it's a post-enlightenment, if you will, construction to say that there is something called the sacred 
and something called the profane. Even the way we talk about religion as a category and politics as a category, that is sort of, that relies on an ideological premise. We are products of a classical liberal society, at least most of us are, and we are products of enlightenment thought. So we have been conditioned to think of things in these separate categories. They aren't separate. And we see every day in the Middle East how religion and politics are endlessly intertwined in very complex ways. A couple other things I'll mention. I do very much agree with Jocelyn on this idea of political Islam or Islamism as being something quite modern. And this is really worth highlighting because I think oftentimes in the media discourse in this country, we think about Islamism as something that is hearkening back to a long time ago, to let's say the seventh century, seventh century Arabia. Nothing could be further from the truth. Islamism is the ultimate modernist movement. Um, everything about it is modern and modernist in orientation. And just in the, obvious, the sort of easy way of looking at this is the word Islamism didn't exist and couldn't have existed five centuries ago. If we go to the medieval era, first of all, there wasn't really a word for it, and there didn't have to be a word for it. Um, we only need the term Islamism in the 20th century. So basically, in the pre-modern era, Islam was the overarching premise. It provided the moral, legal, and religious architecture that imbued everything. No one questioned that. It didn't matter whether you were practicing or not. Um, Islam mattered, and Islam played a role in governance and politics. There wasn't anything called secular. There weren't secular individuals. There weren't secular movements. That only comes later, obviously. Um, and Islamism only makes sense in opposition to something which is not Islamism. So in the modern era, when you have the rise of these um, secular ideologies, then some Muslims feel threatened by that, and they want to assert their Islamic identity in a very self-conscious manner. So that's, that's the part about Islamism that I think makes it distinctive. It's very self-conscious and even mannered, if you will. It's something that you have to sort of be conscious of. So if someone's an ordinary Muslim in Egypt and they believe that Islamic law should be the law of the land in some fashion, that Islam, some aspects of Islamic law should be implemented, we wouldn't call that person an Islamist unless they self-consciously orient themselves in the political sphere around those ideas. And it's interesting that, you know, when Islamism emerges in the first half of the 20th century, there's some really interesting phrases that Islamists always use. They talk about the Islamic project, al-mashru al-islami. Why do they use this word mashru, project? Because for them, Islam is something to be applied because it has been lost. If it hadn't been lost, there wouldn't, ha there wouldn't have had to be this effort to apply it. I'll just, I'll close up on just a couple things I'll put out there for conversation um, and just try to uh, fast forward a little bit to where we are now. So Islamism, I think, has, it's failed, uh, fail, and I, I use failed in quotation marks because as Peter said, and as I think we all think, Islamism still matters and it will matter for the rest of our lives. There's no way to eliminate it. It represents something deep in these societies. You can't get rid of it, but you can certainly try, and you'll, you'll fail in the process. But I do think, and this gets to what Jocelyn is talking about in regards to the state, and maybe I have a little bit of a different perspective on this, but I do think the state, I do think the nation state corrupted, not Islam, but although you can make an argument for that, but the nation state corrupted Islamism. And I think we corrupted Islamism in a way. So we Western scholars, you know what we were telling Islamists for much of the 90s and 2000s? We were telling them, hey, get on board with elections, form political parties, de-emphasize all the Islamist things about you, but come to terms with the nation state, embrace the nation state. Um, and you know what? I, I would say that many mainstream Islamist movements followed 
it, they didn't follow it just because of us. I mean, like, I don't want to overstate our influence. But they, they also followed that advice for reasons that were intrinsic to their own societies. They kind of became obsessed with elections. Um, and this is a complaint and a, a critique that you hear from younger members of, say, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, where they feel the conservative old guard, first of all, is very uncreative in its thinking, but also it became very much about the state is the locus of power, and this was the tragedy of the Morsi period, of the Muslim Brotherhood coming to power. They saw that, and everyone in Egypt saw the presidency as the prize. And then you, what did you do? So you, you see state power through elections, legitimately, democratically, and then you use state power to reshape and refashion the broader society. The state becomes an instrument for the broader Islamization of society. But we can debate whether that order is really the way it's supposed to be. In the pre-modern era, the state wasn't seen in this fashion because the state wasn't bloated, powerful, all-encompassing, imbuing everything. The state, in this sense, is a modern construction. So um, I think there, are, there is more questions within an Islamist movements about, hey, um, is this state-centric approach the way to go? And there are some young Muslim Brotherhood members, many of them in exile in places like Istanbul, who are starting to ask these questions. And I've noticed a kind of interesting thing that whether it's Islamists or what I would call, not to define what this new group might be, but I would call them neo-Islamists, um, or even some conservative Muslims in the West who are questioning the state-centric approach and sort of embracing some libertarian ideas. And one, way, one, one former Muslim Brotherhood member put it to me like this, um, weak state, strong society. And I think that a lot of people in the U.S. might sympathize with that view. Um, and I've been noticing some really interesting parallels between what I might call the ortho, sort of orthodox Christian thinkers in the U.S., some of whom are talking about forming intentional communities in the U.S. away from centers of power to kind of preserve their religious traditions. And they're using this, so these orthodox Christians are reminding me of what some of these young Islamists and neo-Islamists are saying. And even on Twitter, they're starting to talk to each other not to get into all that, but I do think there are some new currents that are emerging and they're quite interesting. Great, thanks so much, Shadi and Jocelyn, both of you. L let me move now to, in a sense, ask for your assistance, both of you, with a sort of existential angst that I tend to face when I try to answer basic questions like, what is Islamism? What is political Islam? What's going on around those issues to, to, today? Um, you know, I've been teaching classes on is political Islam for, for 20 years now. And when I first started, I had in my mind a very clear sense of what the class was about. And I knew who they, the I Islamists, were. Um, and I think most of us who sort of came up through graduate school in the 1990s, you know, where the term I I Islamism tended to refer to a fairly discreetly defined subset of political and social movements, we knew what the subject matter was. In the intervening years, however, we've seen a series of developments from, uh, uh, for example, the loss of monopoly on the part of conventionally defined I Islamist movements, uh, their loss of m monopoly in the public sphere um, as other groups and figures have risen up claiming to articulate some particular way of being is Islamic and being engaged in a social project. You use the term project, Shadi. Right, so, so there's new kinds of Islamic actors you know, that are competing alongside the groups that we've known as the I Islamists. You know, and then you have the whole debate about post-Islamism associated with scholars like Olivier Roy, for example, um, who have argued that even as religiosity in the Muslim world has appeared to increase, we've seen a trend towards greater privatization so that people are more interested in individual piety um, uh, as, 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 a, as, a, as a sort of focus rather than the need to connect their religiosity to some kind of social or political project. Um, and then on top of that, you know, as there's greater public awareness 
and discussion here in the United States about these issues, given events in the, the world, there's just increasing broadening vagueness and indeterminacy in what the term Islamism refers to, right? We're using that term to describe everything from ISIS and Al-Qaeda to the party of justice and democracy in Morocco to the Fethullah Gulen movement. There's such a broad range of ent entities with very different histories, very different orientations, very different goals that we're all trying to sort of capture under this one term. So I guess the thing that I want to kind of ask you to help me with is, you know, when, when one is asking the question, what should one be focusing on today in order to understand um, uh, kind of current developments around p political Islam and Islamism, where, where in your mind is, is the main storyline? What, what should we be, be focusing on? Can, can I... Um... Please. I think the first, the first point would be not to assimilate Islamism and political Islam. I think it's, it's a strategic mistake. W what I show is actually all forms of religious nationalism that you find in most of Muslim majority countries is political Islam. The moment you associate your religious affiliation with your national and civic affiliation, even if you are not a Muslim brother, this is a political statement. And again, we, we need to broaden up the understanding of politics. Politics is not about competing for election only. In this sense, I'm going to... Aristotle said that so on political. Man is a political animal, meaning we cannot live without a community. So we have to look at pot political Islam in this sense of what is the religious dimension of the political community I'm building. And it's a very different question just to look at the moderation or inclusion of Islamic political party. Because this is the first distinction to make. The second one is between social movement and political party. Yes political parties fail. It's the fate of all political parties. Mm -hmm. Political Islam as a social movement, or in this case, Islamism as a social movement, because if you cons consider religious nationalism one way of political Islam, and there are the different, different ways of doing it, so the civil form of Senegal versus the hegemonic form of Egypt, for example. This, this is for everybody, even the one who claims themselves secular. Then you have Islamists, which is to indeed have, having an agenda which is more not contesting the state as a major unit, but the capacity of the state to expand religious prescription. So it's more about not the belonging here, but the behaving. And then you have lots of parties, but you have also, and that's what will not disappear because it's very much embedded in this culture, the social movement, meaning women are part of it, a great number of it, and a new generation that, that consider Islam as a major element of the social interaction, and it's not privatized. And in this sense, this is not going to disappear. And I think it's the most challenging aspect of it from a secular mind, indeed, trying to project outside the evolution of religion in Western democracies. Although I would say I come from Europe, and this, this is really a big discrepancy. But if you're in America, it should not be such a big discrepancy, honestly, because religion is part of social life, right? It may be separated institutionally, but it's very much part of social life. Yes. And, and, and again, there are different, different forms of these social movements. You don't have one only. And I, I would just to finish on one thing, because this is where we, uh, we have a, a little disagreement. I think that the state did, I, don't, I would not use the term corrupt, corrupt, but the state, the nation state did dramatically change Islam in, in the sense that at least in Muslim majority country, even the clerics, they think religiously in this framework. And if you hear about Sharia as state law, this is a big gap with the Islamic tradition before the state. If you, um, 
if you see the, the, the questions that are emerging around the public space and what is acceptable or not, even in the most secular state, you have limitation of freedom of speech based on the insult to religion. The only country that has removed all these aspects is Tunisia in its most recent um, uh, constitution, thank you, uh, uh, under the Islamist regime. So you see, what are we talking about here? So uh, uh, ideology, culture, um, political party versus social movement. And it was a mistake of the brothers in Egypt. To, to project themselves as only a political party. That's why Morsi also lost, for the reason you mentioned. But also the moment you are a political party, you are partisan. So nobody will agree with you. If you're a social movement, you have a much broader base. And you are not seen as looking for election. But in my opinion, this is as much political. Yeah. But in the, in the police sense of the term, in the in the community to which I belong, and, and it's a very different approach. So I would say, um, uh, let, me be, let me be careful how, how I phrase this, and, and please don't take this the wrong way. Not, not you, but the audience. Um, so I, I think that, I would say that, in a sense, I mean, all Islam, all Islam is political. Um, and even apolitical Islam is political, in effect. But I'm not just saying, I'm not making a broad statement about how everything in the world is political because I don't think Christianity is, is quite the same. And, um, and as you can, so I, I wrote a book called Islamic Exceptionalism and the, the argument is sort of in the title that I do think Islam is exceptional, not just in any way, but in how it relates to law, politics, and governance, that Islam is uniquely resistant to secularization that Islam won't and can't follow the same course as Christianity, and that, um, and I don't, and also to be clear, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think religions have to be privatized or have to be secularized. Then what's the point of having different religions? I mean, the whole point of Islam is that it's different than other religions. Otherwise, what would be the point of being Muslim? So, um, but, um, but to kind of take this a little bit, you know, um, so it's, what, J what Jocelyn said about the pre-modern era and how conceptions of law and the state have changed, I would maybe take, take that a step further and say, Islam wasn't designed for the nation state. And I'm using the passive voice here because it doesn't matter whether you believe it's, if it's from God or it's not. For, so if, if the Quran is from God, then um, let's not go into that. But, but um, actually, <laughs> but either way, Islam was revealed in, at a specific moment of time, whether you think it was divine or not. It was revealed to a group of people in seventh century Arabia. That was their context. So naturally, the Quran is going to speak more to a pre-modern context. You know, if, if God revealed a different book, let's say in modern New York City, it would not be exactly the same as the Quran, even from a Muslim perspective. I think that's a very difficult argument to make. It would be a different revelation Hypothetically, of course. Um, I don't get in trouble or anything. So, you know, um, anyway, I, but um, I don't know where I'm going here. But, I, but, I mean... Very so, careful. <laughs> but, but, um, but I think, so, p to, to answer your question a little bit more specifically, I don't use the phrase political Islam as much as I use the, fra the term Islamism or Islamist. Because I think, as Jocelyn said, and that's sort of what, what I was getting to, um, all Islam has become politicized everywhere by the state. Whether it's a secular state or a non-secular state, it doesn't matter. And this is the real tragedy of the modern, the modern Muslim majority state, is that the state controls religion, even in the, sec even in the most secular states, whether it's Turkey under Ataturk or um, with the wonderful moderate Islam we're going to have under MBS. Whatever kind of Islam you're talking about, it's all state-controlled and state-centric, except for a couple of examples that Jocelyn mentioned. Um, 
Uh, I don't know anything about Senegal, but presumably Senegal is a wonderful place for partly this reason. <laughs> so I mean, so I think that I think, but I do think Islamism and Islamist is, is something very specific. So Islamists are those who believe that Islam and Islamic law should play a central role in public life. That's part one of my definition. Part two, and this is drawing from Michael Cook, um, that Islamists are those who orient themselves around the political project of making Islam central in public and political life. And that's clear enough, I think. Okay. I want to ask each of you one last question before we turn to the audience. So we will be going to you soon, so please start thinking of your, your questions. And I want to take us straight to the title of this whole session, The Future of Political Islam. And, I, and I'd like you to each put on your, your, your hat that's kind of more of a kind of conventional analyst of regional developments. Um, and given the kind of landscape that I outlined at the beginning of our session this morning, um, the kind of place of particular groups and movements currently in specific countries in the Middle East, this broader regional geopolitical divide around I I Islamism, and some evidence of the ongoing support that these groups have within societies around the region, how, how do you see the future of I I Islamist movements and political parties going forward, say five to ten years? Uh, I would say that it depends a lot on the, uh, on the also socio-political development of the countries. I mean, it, it cannot be dissociated from that. We are a lot talking about Islam is, is incompatible or compatible with democracy. What we are seeing is a deficit of you know, free and fair elections and separation of power and rule of law in most of the so-called secular countries. Uh, so you, what do you, what is, uh, actually if lesson shows something is that Islamist party can move the, the, can push the envelope in this direction a tiny bit, you know. There was a lot of hope on Turkey in this, re in this respect that has been lost since then. But Tunisia is a good example. The problem is that the, the, the examples that are favorable to this expansion toward political development based on Islamism are usually tiny countries. You, you were half joking, I think, on Senegal. You know, who t who, I mean, people don't look at these examples. And, and that's... I think part of also our deficit of having a broader view, we cannot keep uh, assimilating when we are Western observers, Islam in the Middle East. I know it's very tempting for multiple reasons, but if you think of the shift today, most of Islam and Muslims are in the Southeast region. And this debate about civil Islam, about the role of Islam vis-a-vis -vis state and society are very vibrant over there. What I'm witnessing is that Middle Eastern intellectual, Islamist or not, are not creating um, connection with this discourse. So they, everybody tend to reinvent this discussion while, while there are potential for creating a broader kind of, of platform and exchange. And why I'm saying that is because it has been proven in the past that transnational movement can influence local debate. One example, Morocco and the Mudawana, which was the reform a few years ago now of the civil uh, law mm -hmm. in favor of a greater equality between men and women. How did this happen? not only with the good heart of the king. It happened because the transnational movement of Islamist feminism find support and grounding in Morocco and empowered the women there. So what I'm trying to say here is that if we want to look at the connection between Islam and political development, we have to look at a very uh, specific triangulation between what is a state uh, the political institutionally uh, existing uh, uh, relationship of power in the country and how is this moving toward democracy or not? And what are the influence of transnational movement? And, and 
I think that the problem is some of the most uh, efficient transnational movements <laughs> are not automatically favorable to this development of Islam, democracy, and, uh, and social progress. And, and, and this, I would also make a distinction. They are modern, it's true, but they are not modernist in the sense that they do not want progress. They do not want uh, great uh, uh, inclusiveness. Some transnational movements are, others are not, but they are all modern. For me, modernist is about endorsing the project of modernity with a tendency toward greater equality. And I'm not sure that, for example, ISIS is modern. I mean, if you look at the way that they use the technology, the way they think, they are modern, they're far from modernist. And I think this is something also to keep in mind here, because we tend again to assimilate the two terms. So b before I get to Peter, your question, just to comment on this, I don't think, I don't think it's right to. S I personally would argue that Islam mainstream Islamists, at least, are very much modernist. I don't think they are just yeah. modern. No, no, I'm, but I'm, I'm modernist in the sense. So I also don't really. I, I'm a critic of the kind of the arc of history bends towards justice, liberal determinism, and so anytime I hear the word progress, I get a little bit nervous. Why, I mean, someone can be modernist without buying into the project of, of progress. Um, but, putting, but putting all that aside, I, but I, do, I do think that ISIS is not modernist, but is modern, so I do agree with you on that. But So on, on some of the takeaways going forward, um, so my major takeaway from the last seven, eight years, like the, the Arab Spring and post-Arab Spring period, is that extreme levels of repression are very effective. So it's not that repression works, it's that extreme repression works. And I hate to say that, and I wish it wasn't the case, but you know, I don't really see a path forward in Egypt anytime soon. I do think the Sisi regime, or at least what it represents, is, is quite durable. Um, for a number of reasons which we don't have to go into right now. So I think that in a country like Egypt, Islamists are stuck. The most they can do is really wait. And, and to, be, to be fair, they're comfortable waiting because they don't see history, they don't, they don't view history in electoral cycles. And you know, there are so many times I've been in conversations with Brotherhood folks and they've, they've made comments like, you know, like really they're, the long game is very long, you know, so you know, in the end, if it doesn't work out in the next five to 10 years, what about the next 50 years, the next 100 years? So even the way, I do think there are differences in how products of Western liberalism, like, like myself, how I view time and how Islamists view time. And I notice that when we're talking about time, we are, 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 are it, it's sort of hard to talk about because time is something that seems very precise and numerical but they're operating on a different timeline than I am, I think, for the most part. Um, and I would also, but you know, just going forward, at some point we're gonna have to revisit these discussions of what happens when Islamists participate in elections and win elections. We're gonna have to have this whole conversation again in 10 years or 15 years and redo it all. And it was the same thing after Algeria in 1992 when a military, uh, the military stepped in and ended what could have been at least an interesting, if uh, interesting and probably chaotic experiment with democracy that would have told us a lot and helped the Middle East at least try, try some of these different models out. But instead we had a civil war that took 200,000 lives and we sort of had to postpone this conversation to 2011 and then we had what we had and now we have to postpone this conversation. We'll have to revisit it in probably 20 years. And it just, it's really irritating and annoying that we can't move forward in terms of our policy debate. Um, and you know, what we're sort of reduced to advocating with tr you know, Trump folks or Trump supporters or whatever, when it comes to Islamism, we have to really go back to the basics. We're not talking about the more complex aspects of this. It's like, are, is the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization? So really, really like the, 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 um, the bare basics. And that's really unfortunate because we shouldn't be having a debate like that. Because the, que the, the answer to the question is obvious. So I think that that's sort of where we're at right now. Okay, thanks so much, Shadi. So you've had the masterclass from these two. 
um, and we want to turn to you, you now. So could I just ask that when you uh, speak, if you just briefly tell us first who you are um, and, and as much as po possible, please feel free to phrase any speeches that you feel inclined to make in the form of a question. So Jenny, I saw your hand go up first, so we'll, we'll go to you. There, there, there's a microphone rapidly approaching. Thank you so much for this brilliant um, conversation. I guess my question is, and I think that both of you have sort of reached this question indirectly, is Islamism exists outside state structures. So it doesn't need state institutions to thrive. It's about social movements. It's about all the ambiguity of Arab societies. So I guess I think that there's sort of a false question about the existence of the nation state. So, because I think the future of, of Islamism will exist outside the state because that's its more powerful position, as we have seen over the last 30 years. So how do you see some of these movements, and I'm speaking particularly in the Arab world, sort of existing and thriving outside state structures. The, the nation state is, is bankrupt, as everyone agrees. So that's almost an irrelevant question at this point. But how do you see them as social movements as, and, and representing all the ambiguity that they do in Arab societies thriving over the next, say, 20 years, given the fact that they don't need to, be, to perform in a, in a state sort of structural environment, or even as political parties, as you've both pointed out. Thank you. Okay, great. Let me take one more question, sir, down in the front here. Hi. Thanks very much for the, uh, for the, for the presentations. I'm Philip Cornell from the Atlantic Council. Uh, my question is, uh, really, what is the real difference between political Islam or Islamism and the kind of religious or cultural identity-based popular ideologies that have driven and underpinned populist political movements around the world and through history. And, and the corollary would really be, how can you differentiate the rise of political Islam with the rise of populism worldwide with all of its very global underpinnings like technology, media, social media, stuff like that? Thanks. Okay. Good. Thank you. Do either of you want to respond to either or both of those? Uh, Jocelyn? Yeah, actually, it's the question on the nation state and its limit, it's a very pertinent question in the sense that I would not say that the state is not irrelevant anymore. We have been saying that for 30 years since globalization, but it's there. And it remains the only legitimate unit to do international politics. Otherwise, you cannot even explain Daesh, for example. I mean, why create a state, you know? So you, you can go in, so the two are not incompatible. But what, what uh, and it's one of the chapter of the book, what I'm saying is actually the people who have transnational vision are still thinking on a political community in which religion plays a role. In other words, the connection between religious belonging and political belonging that was made by the state, the nation state, not the state as institution, that's why I insist a lot on political culture, on what, I don't want to throw this term, habitus, the thing we never question, thing that we have absorbed. It's about, I am a Muslim, and I am a legitimate member of this political community, while we have done the opposite exercise in the West. We have disconnected as much as we could the political and the religious belonging. So this connection exists beyond the nation state. Now, how do you, the Ummah, the Ummah is a perfect example. This I want to say because, you know, even the clerics, they say the Ummah is a community of all Muslim believers. Historically, it's not. If I were Greek Orthodox in Istanbul under the Ottoman Empire, I am part of the Ummah. So that's exactly this change of Ummah as this sort of community of all Muslims comes from pan-Islamism, which is a political project. 
So you don't need the framework of a territory to have this kind of connection made. And I think this is very important to take into account because, again, that's why I think the nation state has also changed Islam. I have never heard any cleric, and I'm happy to be contradicted, that has raised this historical aspect of the Ummah. And the Ummah was multicultural, multilinguistic, and multireligious. Doesn't mean it was secular. But it's very far from the Ummah, which is homogenized and, and which is like a national project that ISIS tried to build. So this is something that really, for me, instead of showing that the, that the, the state institution may, may have failed, but the religious and political culture of it are far from, from having failed. I would maybe okay. want yeah, to sure, explore. Sure. Shadi, you've been working on populism a lot, so maybe you want to... Yeah, to yeah, question. sure. But just one quick note on the first question very quickly is that I, I, and maybe this is what you're getting at, Jocelyn, with the Indonesian case, but I don't think it's a mistake that in the three countries that are most, um, most democratic and most pluralist out of the Muslim, large Muslim majority countries and the three countries where Islamists are less, less obsessed with the state are the three countries that have more implementation of Sharia Absolutely. on the local level than anywhere in the Middle East. What are those three countries? South and Southeast Asia, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia. That's why those three countries are very interesting cases. Islamists don't have to rule or govern for Islamic law to be implemented. In fact, not to go into too much detail, but actually ostensibly secular parties have participated in the implementation of Sharia on the local level in various regions of, say, Indonesia. So that's just worth keeping in mind. Philip, on, on, on your question, um, so it's, it's funny because um, I, right, I remember the first time I saw, I watched a Donald Trump rally on, on television. I think it was, it was late 2015. And I have to be honest, it was like, it was unscripted, no notes, a whole hour, him, just him doing the whole thing. And I had never seen something like this before. It was new to me then. And I remember being absolutely mesmerized. I'm like, whoa. But it reminded me of something. Trump reminded me of the Middle East. And um, the debates that we started having because of Trump and the debates that we're having now as a country with all of our crisis of liberalism, you know, oh, you know what's the future of liberalism? Oh, why did liberalism fail? Did it fail? And we were, having, uh, we were having similar debates when I was living in the Middle East during the Arab Spring. Politics in, during the Arab Spring, it wasn't about policy. No one cared about economic policy because everyone had the same thing. Unemployment is bad. Let's fight poverty. Boring. Whatever. But what everyone was talking about was the nature of identity. What did it mean to be Egyptian? And how did that affect your relationship with your own state? Could you recognize yourself in your own government? So when you saw Mohammed Morsi the bro, you know, of the Brotherhood and his wife, who wore hijab, so she's the, first, she's the first lady of Egypt in 2013, and a lot of secular elites looked at that and said, um, I, can't under, I can't understand my country if she represents on the international stage our country. So similar in some ways to how I think a lot of us lib liberal elites view Trump. We don't, that, we don't, is that what America is? So it's, it's interesting that, and also the tensions between liberalism and democracy, and I, start, I first started working on that set of issues as it related to the Middle East. That's where, you know, more democracy doesn't mean more liberalism. Here I'm talking about what we associate with the classical liberal tradition, not liberalism in the American left political sense. Um, and here, for the first time in America, but this is also applicable throughout Europe, um, you know, lib democracy and liberalism are pulling apart. They don't go together, and they don't have to go together, and maybe they shouldn't go together. So it's, it's sort of interesting to me how America is catching up to the Middle East. Okay. Yeah. Jenny, one thing I would add in response to your question is that I, I would expect to see a sort of retrenchment within the movements as distinct from the political parties 
in a lot of these groups in, in the coming years. Because I think the, the availability of political power presented them with a conundrum that they did not figure out how to address, which is the fact that once they were in power uh, and were responsible for doing things and fixing, fixing things and getting stuff done, they had an electorate that was expecting them to solve, for example, massive socioeconomic contradictions and they just didn't have the policy imagination or capacity or experience to do that. Um, and precisely the things that, that tended to define them as Islamist, i.e. putting more religion into public life or moving towards Sharia law, were precisely the things that the electorate was least interested in. So there was just enormous exposure to risk um, and you know th this is something that confronted the FJP incredibly starkly. And Mohammed Morsi, I think, just singularly failed to rise to that moment. And I think that was a cautionary tale to a lot of these movements. And so I would expect to, you know, for a broad trend, I would expect to see a sort of return to an emphasis on the movement and then a discussion within the movement, maybe about the idea that you don't need to set up specific political parties tied to Islamist movements, but more the idea that members of the movements could potentially vote for mm -hmm. different political parties, depending on what their positions and policies are. So Peter, one thing I'll just mention on that. So one, one idea that comes up, I think, more in my conversations with, with certain <laughs> brotherhood, brotherhood members in exile is this idea of, you know, it's a very difficult one, the relationship between a religious movement yeah. and a political party. And, you know, should they be separate? Should they be intertwined? And so on. And one, one possibility that comes from one faction of the Brotherhood in Egypt, because the brother, Egyptian Brotherhood is, is going through an unprecedented split, which hasn't gotten much attention in the, in, the, in the Western media, but it's really, I think it's really important. But this idea of, could you have um, one religious movement, the Muslim Brotherhood, and then members of the Brotherhood would be free to, ch not to choose any party they want, but they could form different Islamist parties, that reflect the brotherhood school of thought. And that sounds very nice and pluralistic and all of that, but there will be a real problem there because depending on the electoral system, you could have a situation where in a single district, two members of the brotherhood are competing against each other for the same seat. How does that affect the internal cohesion of the movement? Uh, I would say this would be the kiss of death for any kind, and I would not call them a religious movement. It is a social movement, mm -hmm. and in this sense, I prefer the term civil that is used by Hanushi, for example, rather than Islamist or, or Islamic or religious. It, it is a group, again, that doesn't address the, the, the population through the belief angle or, or religious practice angle. They, they really try to to address social challenge. And if we know that even if you don't have a member, if you're not a member, they will take into account your, your, your uh, need or at the yeah. grassroots level. So I would not really call them a religious movement. But to be a member of the Brotherhood, it, it, it's really a lot of it is about strict religious practice. I mean, if we're talking about in the- In terms of leadership. No, no, the members, to become a member and to advance in the tiered system of yes, the Brotherhood is very much about religion. It is about studying and, and indeed practice, but the, the relationship to the population is not about the religion as such. Again, and I think it goes from this idea that religion as some kind of specificity vis-a-vis -vis social. I think what they are doing is we, we are acting here as citizen and animated by a religious belief, but it is not about convincing people about belief. Let, let, let me bring some more yeah, questions. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and yeah. so I think get, it's, get, get, it's get very important yeah. to make this so, difference. So, ma'am, here in the front, uh, and then Kamran, um, and then ma'am, you, you in the front as well. So. Yang Lo Yun, Foundation for Empowerment. As a development uh, economist, I'm now working on the uh, issues of the uh, integration of the uh, immigrants in Korea, Europe, and America. So as a practitioner, I'm asking very, very practical question. You are talking about the uh, nature of identity, and you are talking about um, religious belonging and the political belonging which is beyond the nation state. But what I'm talking about the inter-nation, beyond the nation state. 
For example, I was in Germany and I observed very, very uh, carefully. The problem is that when there was a German election, many issues affect the uh, uh, Muslim um, Germans, especially Turkish Germans and others. But they were not very much interested in those issues in the uh, German election. But the, uh, we know that what uh, Erdogan did and these Turkish, I'm not, I'm not, I should not really stand out on the Turkish, but Turkish um, Germans are so much interested in uh, the Turkish election and how the Erdogan threat to send affect the, uh, all these things. So this is really beyond nation state. And the, uh, this uh, political, Muslim, political Islamization in those countries are affecting the, uh, uh, this uh, European other policy as well. So this has been a concern, very urgent question. As a Korean, I'm not, I'm not too urgent, but this is my question that, you know, like, what kind of impact of the political Islam, Islam had their own uh, their, um, citizen of the origin in other countries? My just second very brief question is that you have been talking about it is not only Muslim. I mean, it's not only Islam. Yes, um, Buddhism and the others, I mean, the Christianity are all religion and they had the war. But one different thing is I would like to say in the 14th century in Korea, Confucianists and uh, uh, Buddhists really fought. So Confucianists won. But the difference between the uh, uh, Christianity and the Buddhism and the Muslim as a really third person who is ignorant must say that Buddhism and the Christianity never really said that you have to have a jihad. You know, like uh, you really don't get involved in politics. You are out of politics like a shatata. But the uh, Islam is very special for me that, uh, you know, like uh, from the beginning, it really went for jihad, and the uh, Muhammad's uh, I, the successors became the uh, whatever the religious leader, whether Shia or Sunni, the way. Thank you very much. Good. Let's, let's take Kamran's question as well while we're right here. Uh, Kamran Bukhari, Center for Global Policy and author of Political Islam in the Age of Democratization. So thank you so much. This is very insightful. Uh, I have so many questions, but I'll limit it to two. Number one. Uh, is Islamism a subset of political Islam? Why? Because, number one, political Islam spans going back in history, if we take the starting point of the revelation. And as you said, uh, Islamism is a modern phenomenon. Uh, secondly, those whom we call secular leaders, from their point of view, they're not, their political program, the, the Jamal of the Nasser's of the world, the Ataturks, uh, the Jinnahs, they never said that we're leaving Islam to adopt this democracy or, or liberalism, however they framed it in their time period, or socialism, as in the case of uh, Nasser. Uh, number two, uh, that was the first question. Number two is, is, are the lines between the category of what we call Muslims because of increasing religiosity blurring with the category of Islamists? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, um, I would like to address both because the question is Islam different from Confucianism or Buddhism? The, the position is religion is multivocal. You, you are presenting Buddhism as a separation. I mentioned the Buddhism in Sri Lanka. They are like the jihadists. They don't use the term jihadist, but they do the same thing. So. In, in, in terms of rejecting the diversity of the population. So I, I would say that we have to take as, as a basic starting point, religions are multivocal. You can use them in different ways. So you have to contextualize it. And the contextualization is politic, not in the sense of extremism or election, it is about how, again, think, how do I define my political community? It can be local, it doesn't have to be national, and what is the role of religion in it? And I bet that for any believer, this is a challenge that you have to deal with, not only for Muslims. Then you have different 
uh, experience according to, to different contexts. So, so in this sense, the problem of the Turks in Germany cannot be taken only through the fact that Islam is propagating jihad today. It is much more complex than that. You are absolutely right that the loyalty of Turkish, uh, in, of, uh, Turkish German or German Turks are, is also to Turkey. But this is, for me, again, a strength of the nation state. It is not an, an, an affiliation to the whole Ummah. It's, I am German, but I am also Turkish. So, uh, again, we, we have to be careful on how we, we phrase some situation. And again, this is also for the political discourse of it. We, we have to, be, to take a little distance with, with the situation and, and not assume a sort of uh, um, exceptionalism of, of Islam like that, because this is, this is not viable in the, in the long term. And, and to go back to your point, yes, Islamism is a subset of political Islam. We can, uh, people disagree with me in, on where you start political Islam. And I draw the line between the empire and the nation state. Unlike what people think, the caliph is the head of the whole, uh, you know, territories under the rule of Islam, but not everybody has to be Muslim. And actually, there is a difference in the Sharia, that is the monopoly of the clerics, who are not paid, not controlled by the caliph. And so the, the, the ulema manage the local communities, even in their religious diversity, not only for Muslims. So this is an arrangement that is in some way a differentiation between what is Islam and what is politics. And at the time, the caliph has two words for that. So the, the confusion between I am a Muslim, I am a citizen, and the state takes care of it, is a nation state. And, and for me, this is, this is a key element to take into account. And I, uh, sorry, I just want to finish yeah. on that. Mm. We are not paying, because we have been brought in it. Nation is framing us. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy, but it means that you have tons of surveys that show that even mental illness, problems that are deeply personal have been changed by the nation state. And we have to start thinking of it. And again, not a state policy or governmental or, or, or action of a government. Who, how do we define ourselves as believers, citizens, locally, nationally, internationally? And religion is part of it for everybody, if you believe uh, in uh, any religion. So on the question about jihad, so I actually do agree to a certain extent that, I mean, Islam obviously is, is quite different than Buddhism or Confucianism, and not just in some random ways, but specific ways. And I think, I mean, in, in the Islamic context, 99.9% .9 of Muslims aren't going to have any direct interaction with doctrines around jihad. That, so it's not a big deal with the vast majority of Muslims. So that said, no one, can, no one can argue, as far as I'm concerned, that jihad is not unequivocally part of the Islamic legal tradition and that it's part of the Quran. It's there. And I don't even see that as a bad thing. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't there be, um, and, and um, why wouldn't there be state-sanctioned uh, uh, just war, if you will, to make sort of that comparison? Yeah. Um, and um, so, but, but to kind of go a little bit deeper on that point, um, so because Prophet Muhammad was interested in, in territory, he wasn't just fighting something and wanting to be left alone. There was clearly an interest in governance, if you will. So the only way to get territory, at least in the pre-modern era, for the most part, was by capturing territory from other people. For the, and for the most part, people aren't going to just give you their territory all the time. So you have to use violence. Like, this seems so obvious to me. I, I don't think it's a problem. I don't, if, Islam, if Islam is a religion that's supposed to talk about all facets of life, it would be completely weird if the Quran had nothing to say about violence. That would actually make it seem less divine from a Muslim standpoint because why isn't God speaking to these very tangible concerns that Muslims have in 7th century Arabia? So of course Islam talks about violence in very specific ways. And by violence, I don't mean terrorism. I mean violence, very different things, right? 
So, but on the, um, on the uh, second question, Kamran, I would just say very quickly, and it sort of gets, how do we distinguish between um, Islamists um, and conservative Muslims? Well, first of all, I, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to call someone an Islamist unless they see themselves in that light. So part of it is self-definition. But I think I sort of touched on this earlier, that you can be someone who believes in the full implementation of Islamic law. But again, if you're not organizing politically around that objective, I don't think you can call that person an Islamist. When it comes to Jinnah and Nasser and other secular leaders, they cared about Islam in their own way. But I think the main difference is they weren't trying to Islamize society in a broader sense. Like when Nasser was thinking to himself, like what does he want to accomplish before he leaves this world? That wasn't really high on his priority list where, you know, if Mohammed Morsi or other Islamist leaders who have power, they do actually care about um, whether people um, observe certain standards of Islam in a social sense. I, I think if I may on your point about the German case, it's, it's a case that very nicely illustrates a point that's at the heart of the work that, that Jocelyn has been doing, which is the fact that ever since there was a critical mass of Turkish labor migrants in Germany from the 1960s onwards, you've had the presence in Germany of an instrument of the Turkish state, more specifically the Directorate of Religious Affairs or the Dianet, which, which, which you know, is the, the very manifestation of what Jocelyn terms he hegemonic Islam. Because the project of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk which is often sort of caricatured as the evacuation of religion from all facets of society was not that at all. It was about the creation and even promotion of a very particular sense of Muslimness that needed to be cultivated and patrolled by the state so that when there were Turkish labor migrants in Germany, the Dianet needed to be there to make sure that their religious life continued to be conducted in a way that was compatible on the assumption that they would be coming back to Turkey at some point. Later then, I think, once it was clear that they were staying, the Dianet stayed, I think, in order to ensure that ideas around a more politically active conception of Islam, because by that point you also had in Germany the, the Miligorush movement, which is you know, the more Islamist-oriented um, dimension of Turkish political life, you know, the, the two were, were, were competing. So in, in that sense, the kind of transplantation of those politics you know, I think is actually most acutely present in the case of Germany, although there has been some presence of Islamist movements among Muslim communities living in Europe and North America. And in fact, the, uh, the, the Pew Research Center uh, did a study in 2010 that looked very specifically at what happens when Islamic movements of various sorts that originated in the Muslim majority world became transplanted and reproduced in Europe and North America. That's specifically the, the study of it. It's a, Fantastic study, which, which I wrote. Um, <laughs> so uh, let, let, let me do one more round of, of, of questions. Jackie did some great surreptitious hand gestures as the others, so take you. And then I want to avowedly go to the back of the room, which I feel has been neglected. So um, let's get, get Jackie and, and let me see some hands. You leaning out, and that's a very good technique too, leaning out in the, in the aisle. I, I like that. And then from the very, very back, uh, uh, sir, in the, in the middle, pink shirt kind of pink? Yeah. Great. So, Jackie. It's purple. Purple. Um, Lavender. My name is Jackie O'Neill. I'm with the Institute for Inclusive Security. And Jocelyn, you gave the example of transnational Muslim feminists having a significant impact on civil law in Morocco. We've seen examples of feminist Muslims having impact in constitution in Tunisia, et cetera. So I'm wondering what you see as the future of the intersection between feminist, feminism within Islam and political Islam, given that feminism is fundamentally about the reordering of power. So your thoughts on, from either of you or all three of you, on the, the either rejection or incorporation of that reordering of power within the political element of Islam. Thanks. Great. Good. Um, and then in the aisle. My name is Jason Hu from Wintop Group, based on Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, my question is for both of the panelists, and my question is sort of a following up for Peter's question. Might it be a little bit uh, politically incorrect? So that's why Peter didn't push it. The question is, uh, what's your opinion that uh, Islam as a religion emerged within itself their own religious reform? I mean, like uh, 
uh, Christianity, we all know had a huge religious reform in their history. And uh, like Judaism, they kept continuously uh, reforming themselves. Even Buddhism. Uh, two years ago, Dalai Lama told me that uh, Buddhism needs to be combined to be consistent with science. So, so every other religions are thinking about changing themselves. What do you two experts think about the outlook of the Islam in this pers- uh, on this direction? Thanks. Sure, thank you. And then finally, in the, the very back. Hi, my name is uh, Stephen Howard, and I work with In Defense of Christians in the Middle East. And so my question is actually pertaining to uh, non-Muslim minorities who live in predominantly Muslim countries, and specifically really the prospects of Islamism and and creating a more inclusive society for them. And just to give one very specific example, I was in Palestine for for Christmas during the the protest movements against the embassy move to Jerusalem, and I was staying with an Orthodox Christian family. And while they're certainly not huge fans of Israel, they completely felt excluded from participation in civic society because the opposition to the Jerusalem move was people were just really chanting Al-Aqsa, 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 and they're Christian, like that, that isn't a religiously significant site for them. Like the movement itself was so defined by religion that they didn't feel comfortable to participate. Whereas if you look at other political movements in the Middle East, especially over this last century, it could be nationalism, it could be socialism, Baathism, you did have a, a participation um, from minority communities. So specifically... You know, Islamism is not going anywhere. It's very popular in many of these countries. Um, what can it do? Or can, I mean, is it even possible for it to do a better job of incorporating these communities in its narrative and what it's trying to contribute to these countries? So thank you. Great. Thank you. So we have Islamic feminism. We have Reformation. We have Christian minorities in the Middle East. So. Okay. So let's start with feminism. Uh, I think... Um, the movement have been changing very rapidly. Uh, you know, you, you had in, in the, it's still there, there was a sort of split between the secular feminist and the Islamist feminist. But the new generations are really trying to overcome this simplification. And they are also trying, again, feminism is a social movement. Not only in the in the <laughs> in, in the Muslim world, everywhere, and that's why it's very counterproductive for any social movement to turn into a political party, because then you 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 are on a different level. But for me, a social movement is political in the sense that it's trying to do a change at the grassroots level of relationship between people, here in this case between gender. And what happened is that, unlike what people think, most of of the um, social movement based on Islam have been very lagging behind in terms of gender equality. I mean, it's okay to grant equality to citizens in the public space. Accord, you know, you can vote. You, uh, they will not contest women uh, as social actors or political actors. Most of them, we are not talking about the Salafi here. We are talking about most of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood-oriented movement. But when it comes to equality in the marriage, in the divorce, <laughs> in the custody of children, this is behind. You know, and this is uh, something that is across movement and Muslim countries. So what, what some of these women are trying to do, especially the new generation, is to pull up not automatically an opposition. Opposing is weakening, but to produce alternative approach to, because, to Islam. Because what, what the men are saying is this is Islam. We cannot touch on this. It's okay. You can go to university. You can um, you can even run for politics. You know that's not a problem. Iran is a typical case in point. Iran, the women outnumbering the men in university. But as as a, if I can make a raccourci, <laughs> but they cannot divorce their husband. And if you, I have talked to lots of young Muslim women, how uncomfortable it is for them to endorse the Me Too movement for exactly this kind of reason. This is, this is a very, very 
vulnerable point. And I think the new generation, and again, people who are in non-Muslim or minority context have a better kind of empowerment on that. So I would say this will be a major shift, but not, not right now. On Islam and reform, Islam has been changing all the time. I mean, again, 1798, when Bonaparte goes to Egypt, you have a whole reform movement. We, and we talk about it. The people were, were going to Paris and London to learn the technique. I even give you 1876, the Ottoman Empire decriminalized homosexuality. Okay, so things have happened. It doesn't mean that they are still here. We have this kind of vision, and this I agree with you, of the progress that, you know, you do all your steps forward and you never go backward. What we are learning everywhere, including in the West, and that's why populism is an indicator, you can go backward. And that's a tragedy in some way of lots of Muslim society. There have been lots of advancement and attempt to go backward. But you, you, say you never go exactly at the same point. There is some kind of you know, little leap uh, in, in advance. And on the Muslim minorities, that's exactly the drama of what I was saying, of connecting Islamic belonging and national belonging. That's exactly that. The Copt and not only the Christian Palestinian, you know, they would say, I am Muslim by nationality and Copt by religion. They have absorbed a lot of them this kind of dilemma. So the question is, how do you disconnect the Islamic belonging and the national belonging? This is a question, and I think you mentioned it, a lot of young people outside Muslim countries are trying to address this question. But it's a tough one, because they are not helped not only by Muslim leaders, but even by Westerners, you know? We have, we considered the Saudi version as the true Islam. So go and fight against that, you know? This is, this is, these are real issues that are beyond, you know, a strategic or, or punctual alliance. It does change the balance of power and how these new voices can be heard. For now, nobody is even listening to them. So, so I agree with Jocelyn that um, there has been a lot of reform. But I would make a distinction between reform and I think what you're getting at, the idea of a reformation. And here, and so you said something really interesting. I think it was that, you know, basically why can't, why can't, why can't Islam or will Islam be like all the other religions, right? Um, so again, I, not to sort of belabor, belabor my argument, but you know, um, no, I actually sort of agree with you in the sense that I don't think Islam is going to have a reformation. But I would sort of pose the question a little bit differently. Why would Islam have a reformation? Why does it need to have a reformation? Why does Islam have to be like Judaism or Christianity or whatever? I mean, I just don't understand the starting premise when that's raised. I know where it's coming from, but I guess I can't totally relate to it. Um, on the question about minorities, so I, I sort of don't, this is a problem without a solution. <laughs> so Islamists are never gonna be 100% cool with minorities. And Islamists are never going to, be, if, okay, well, 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 I'll just let me finish. Uh, and Islamists are never going to fully embrace at least the Western conception of what gender equality is. Yeah, is for, for them to embrace these things, they would essentially have to become classical liberals. But Islamists are called Islamists because they're not classical liberals. Islamists, by definition, if they intend to continue as Islamists, will remain at least somewhat illiberal. That's the whole point of Islamism. If Islamists give that up, then there's no particular reason for them to be who they are. I just want to make, you are right, but for me the question is what I call the, the rights of the self. You are absolutely right, but I don't think it's a question of non-Muslim minorities. Actually, the discourse on that is more open and inclusive in the new leadership than we think it is. But it's about the sexuality, the, and the status of family and the status of gender. This is what distinguish indeed a, a Muslim democracy from a complete secular democracy. But otherwise, all the other points are indeed, more, they can be debated, nobody will agree, but you see this trend. So what is, it's what do I do with my body? 
This is where all Muslims are having a problem, and I have tons of surveys that show that it's also true for Muslims in the West. And this is, again, you can differentiate between individual rights. These people are getting more and more a climate acquainted to it, even in Saudi Arabia, too, certainly not. But when it comes to what do women do, what do I do with my body and my sexuality, at the interpersonal level, this is a big issue. But I would say it's an issue for lots of, uh, lots of democratic society. I don't think, I mean, the debate we are having here, <laughs> but the, the, the outcome may be different, but, but this is a big, uh, what's happening here is more secular. The phrasing is more secular. In Muslim country, it is about the role Jocelyn, of religion. isn't it fair to say that it's more of an issue in many Muslim majority contexts than it is in the U.S. or European democracies. Yes, it's a problem everywhere. It'll always be a problem everywhere. And we're 11 oh, minutes past oh, time. Okay, yeah, well. yeah. So, so I guess we'll, I, I'll, I'll leave it to Peter, but that, I would just sort of, yeah. yeah okay. I, no, <laughs> I agree. It's not going conversation. It's so about if, making if, this if, in the law. And if, this yeah. so if you'll terrible. permit me just very briefly on the point about the r r reformation, please. Well, I, l let, me, let me add this to it. I actually think that Christianity is the exception rather than the rule when it comes to re reformation, in that I don't think you've seen anything like that in any other religion. Certainly we have reformed Judaism, but the process through which it emerged historically was very different. What was distinctive about Western Christianity, right, as distinct from the Eastern churches, is that there was a centralized point of religious authority. There was a pope. There was a, there was a central uh, authority location against which a reformation could take place. Um, and that was very much the story of the, the, the Reformation. You don't have that same centralized authority in Sunni Islam. Even in Shi'i Islam, which has a little bit more like hierarchies of religious authority, there's still not a single point. And so the kind of question of why don't you have in Islam a Reformation like you have in Christianity, well, the religion and religious authority is just structured in a fundamentally different way. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, but of course, we will see you all, as Shadi suggests, back in 10 years when we'll have the same conversation again. But please join me in thanking our panelists.